talking about how Protestants are not apostolic, oh, excuse me, Catholic. Oh, no, apostolic. <clears throat> so, 2534, legitimate mission was destroyed in Protestantism from the very beginning, for the Reformers could not claim for themselves either ordinary or extraordinary mission. They could not claim ordinary since it would have been necessary to obtain this mission from a church already existing. See, that's ordinary jurisdiction is uh, what pertains by nature to the office. That's why the bishop of the diocese is called the ordinary, because his rule of the diocese pertains by, his, by the very nature of the office to it, whereas the vicar general has delegated authority etc. Uh, the, so there's, uh, that's ordinary jurisdiction. <clears throat> but the reformers were not sent by a church already existing, but instead they rebelled against it and protested against it. Nor could they claim an extraordinary jurisdiction which is asserted gratuitously and which contradicts the facts. Our Lord never taught that there would be any mission to be hoped for outside of the ordinary mission. This reasoning is absolutely certain, nor could it be of any wonder that Luther changed his position concerning his mission against the Catholic Church no less than 14 times. So, you know, who gave him the authority to found a new church? <coughs> much less does Protestantism go back to the apostles by a public succession. Obviously. The reformers distinguished by a great interval the primordial church and the pure gospel, the time in which the doctrine, sacraments, and the government of the church was totally corrupt. See, So there was this big long period, maybe about a thousand years, where everything was horrible. Therefore, the connection of Protestantism with the Apostolic Church has been interrupted. See, so they can't claim that they have an, have an uninterrupted history that goes back to the early church. And even the early church, you know, where people, do people have Bibles? Was that the worship of the early church, people with Bibles? Interpreting it for themselves? Can you prove that from the early church? Can you see Protestantism in the early church? Can you find it? The consequence is clear. For Babylon, the kingdom of Antichrist, and the beast of the apocalypse interrupted this connection. See, the Catholic Church for them is Babylon, and the Antichrist, the beast of the apocalypse. See, so... For the reformers called the Roman Church by these names. Thus Calvin was able to assert the true series of ordination was interrupted by the tyranny of the Pope. Now we need a new help in order to restore the Church. But whatever the reformers of the 16th century taught about the tyrant Pope, it remains an indubitable fact that there was no other Christian Church for many centuries besides the Roman Church. You see, up to Photius, the schism of Photius, there was only one Christian church. And then his schism was defeated, and then you had 1054, uh, the, another schism, so you had two Christian churches, so to speak. But nowhere do you find a Protestant church. So there was one Christian church for 800 years. Add to this that the early church condemned many of the dogmas of the reformers. You can't find Protestantism in the early church. It isn't there. Protestantism is a new church. Therefore, it is not apostolic. Proof of the antecedent. It is evident from public facts. Protestantism abandoned in rebellion that church which goes back by an uninterrupted succession of Roman pontiffs to blessed Peter. At least they had the decency to revolt against it. The modernists want to use that very succession 
to, to further their heresy. That is the very problem. At least these people <laughs> figured out that they, they're not the same thing as the Catholic Church. At least they did that, made it very clear. But the present scum, known as the modernists, had, had the goal to, to hijack, you might say, the, uh, the structure of the church for their own ends. Therefore, St. Cyprian criticizes Novation for the fact that he comes from no one and succeeds to no one. Furthermore, the beginnings of that heresy are fixed to the 16th century. For who saw any Lutherans before Luther? Calvinists before Calvin. And even if you would say, well, they weren't really Lutherans, they weren't called that, where do you find his doctrines? Where do you find Calvinism? Where do you find Lutheranism before these reformers? You can't. It doesn't exist. For this reason, the, the reasoning of Tertullian can be applied to Protestantism. You are novelties. You are recent. You are from yesterday. Unfortunately, he became one of those. See, Protestantism perpetually changes its doctrine. Therefore, it is not apostolic. For this reason, from the 17th century, in which Bossuet wrote his book called The Variations of the Protestant Churches, Protestantism has changed from that error which the first reformers taught to such an extent that they could hardly recognize their own work if they came back to life. So there, there is just a whole array of doctrines uh, and doctrines that have evolved. See, there is, everything is private interpretation. So if you have private interpretation, the only thing left to do is to find other people who agree with your private interpretation and found a little church. Because the church comes from below for Protestants. It's, it, these are Gemeinde, communities, that are formed by people who believe the same way. So where, where is apostolicity there? Right. Objections. Protestants profess that the books of the Old and New Testament are their rule of believing and acting, therefore they are not deprived of sanctity. Response. I distinguish the antecedents. See, antecedent. Protestants profess that those books are their rule of believing and acting in an extremely imperfect manner. I concede. Perfectly, I deny. Four things show that how much Protestantism is imperfect in this regard. A, the authenticity of many of these books is rejected by many. So they have their own rules of what is a, a, an inspired book or not and what parts of the book pertain to inspiration and which do not. Uh, Luther called the Apocalypse a, you know, a, a book of fairy tales, essentially. But now, Revelation for the Protestants, I mean, that's probably the most important book. He called the Epistle of St. James an Epistle of Straw. But now the, the Lutherans accept the Epistle of Straw. So what is their criterion? B, many do not believe in divine inspiration. A lot of the rationalists... See, because the authority of the church is spurned, they have adopted the imbecility of the private spirit, which we've talked about. D, Luther, Calvin, and the fanatical sects have profaned the sacred scriptures by their impious and absurd doctrines. Uh, bad translations, too, erroneous translations, like the, uh, that famous chorus from the um, Messiah, for unto us a child is born, uh, unto us is, uh, that's all from King James. And they translate uh, pater, what is in the Vulgate, pater futuri seculi, which means the father of the world to come. 
meaning referring to Christ in the New Testament, the everlasting Father, which is a heresy because Christ is not the everlasting Father. He's the Son. The chorus sounds really nice, but it has a heresy in it. <laughs> and the Prince of Peace. It's a really great chorus, one of the best things that he ever wrote. Um, so uh, that's just an example, but there are many other examples in the, of errors in the King James Bible. And as I told you, Luther added the word alone after faith in one of the epistles, I think it was Romans, uh, because he said that's what St. Paul meant. So in his, he translated the Bible into German, which really uh, is sort of the standard of modern German. I mean, it's, it's not quite the same as modern German, but it, it became a kind of standard way of speaking German or writing German, the Lutheran Bible. Um, <clears throat> and, and the King James Bible, too, in English, sort of set up English in a standard way. Uh, the King James Bible is very elegant in its English. Unfortunately, it's wrong. If you see some of the ways that it translates the Psalms, I mean, it's not even close sometimes, but it sounds great. I mean, it's beautiful poetry. Beautiful, beautiful. It's just not even close. So... Um, so besides Protestantism even if they had preserved with complete integrity the divine scriptures would not shine forth with the mark of sanctity solely because of having preserved these books since no codex not even the most sacred by itself manifests the supernatural life of the church so simply a dead book doesn't manifest the supernatural life of the church. Instance, often many Protestants were outstanding for uprightness and good morals. Pious institutions, orphanages, etc. have been founded by them. Therefore, Protestantism is holy. Response, I distinguish the antecedent. The holiness of Protestant men and institutions is either natural or ordinary, I concede, Heroic and of extraordinary supernaturality, I deny. This proposition, all the works of the infidels are sins, and the virtues of philosophers are vices against bias, and the other outside of the church no grace is given against Canel, was condemned by the Roman pontiffs. See, so uh, that's the other side. In other words, you can't say that uh, actual graces are not given to non-Catholics. That's condemned. Uh, you can't say that uh, the, uh, all the works of infidels are sins, even when they you know, give to the poor. That, well, that's a sin. That's what Bias said. And the virtues of philosophers are vices. You know, so if the, a philosopher is just, well, that's evil. That's vice. This is all sick of stuff. All right. Uh, so that's, that was condemned by Pius V. For greater reasons, some natural virtues are found in Protestants who err in good faith. So they're capable of natural virtues, and many of them have natural virtues. In fact, when these are joined to Christ with baptism and faith, which is sufficiently explicit in the Most Holy Trinity and the Incarnate Word, it can happen that they can please God by supernatural virtues and that a certain light of pious institutions can be evident in the sight of mankind. Those uh, who would say that these effects are from principles which are specifically Protestant, namely the private spirit or justification through faith alone. See, he's saying that they can achieve supernatural virtues by a valid baptism and by 
supernatural faith, they could do that because they're invincibly ignorant of the true faith. That's what he's, the point he's making, that that's possible. They have a valid baptism, they receive sanctifying grace. If they don't impede that in some way by mortal sin, the, and if their infidelity, you know, the infidelity, I mean, they're, they're, the fact that they do not join the true church is the effect of invincible ignorance. They are capable, given a lot of conditions, they are capable of supernatural acts. That's anti-Fini. Indeed, the supernatural virtues are produced in spite of these things. <laughs> it's not their Protestant religion that gives them supernaturality. As a matter of fact, the Protestant religion is against it. That's why the non-Catholic religions are not means of salvation. They're means of damnation. If you follow the non-Catholic manual, you, know, you get the instruction book, uh, this is what you should do, you go to hell. It's a means of damnation. But if, despite that, that book and you know, despite those instructions, people can overcome those things uh, by positing certain acts. I don't want to go into all of that. But uh, the, the, uh, and in spite of their false religion, are able to achieve uh, sanctify, uh, sanctifying grace and supernatural virtues. All right. Indeed, the supernatural virtues are produced. Okay, virtues, however, which are heroic and of extraordinary supernaturality, which are evident in saints, miracles, and charisms, are sought in vain among the sects. So yes, you have virtuous people, you could have supernaturally virtuous people in a non-Catholic sect, but you're not going to see any perfection because they don't pursue perfection. The whole idea of pursuing perfection is contrary to their religion. There is no observance of the evangelical councils. There is no priest like St. Vincent de Paul, no monk like St. Bernard, no king like St. Louis. No doctor like St. Thomas Aquinas. Indeed, we, uh, need we say more, the kind of priest, monk, martyr, and virgin consecrated to God is extinct among the Protestants. Where are their monasteries? Where are their... Where is that, that drive to holiness and perfection that you see in the Catholic Church? It, it was never there. It's against their whole principle because you're a sinner inside. You're a sinner. No matter what you do, you're a sinner. Instance, Protestantism is holy if, by its influence, it reformed the very Roman Church. But when Protestantism arose, the reformation of the Roman Church followed. From this it follows that the work of the reformers was outstandingly holy. <laughs> uh, response, I distinguish the major. If Protestantism was the cause of the reform of the Roman Church, I concede. The occasion I deny. So there you have a case of what is known as a occasional causality. See, for true causality, the effect must flow from the cause. It must be a true movement of being to the effect. So fire heats the water by a proper causality. But an occasional cause is something that merely uh, is... Um, there's no flow, it simply uh, is a, uh, a, a paroxidens, an accidental um, cause that puts into motion something like this. Um, so um, the, uh, applying the, the match to the wood in the fire would be an occasional cause. See, the application of the match. The fire of the match is, is a real cause, but the application of it is an occasional cause. Um, 
the fact that lightning burns down your barn and you build a new barn, the lightning was an occasional cause of building the new barn. You would not have built the new barn except that the lightning hit it and the thing burned up. So you wouldn't say the lightning caused the new barn. See, only accidentally it did. It was the occasion of building a new barn. Or a tornado came and wrecked the old, the old thing. See, so the tornado was the, actually built the new barn. And you'd be sick if you said that. You have to go to the hospital, mental hospital. Yes? If Protestantism was the cause, if. When Protestantism arose, the Roman Church was reformed by virtue of Protestantism, I deny, by the Roman Church's intrinsic virtue, I concede. So it was an occasion, yes. The Sophism is post hoc ergo propter hoc. That's a famous fallacy. That's something... It means after this, therefore because of this. Because something comes before something else. That doesn't mean that the first thing is the cause of the second thing. It may be, but it's, that's, you can't necessarily draw that. That's one of the objections that the modernists say against traditionalists, because we blame everything on Vatican II. They say, oh, that's post hoc ergo propter hoc. Uh, but you can trace all of the reforms to Vatican II and to official post-Vatican II documents. Everything that is wrong with the church can be traced to that. And you t in 1958, at the death of Pius XII, the church was flourishing in all lands. Religious life, uh, I mean, every aspect of the church was flourishing. Then the council hit, <laughs> the whole thing blew up. And you can trace the reasons for it, the destruction of religious life, or all of those things. I mean, it's become a, essentially a Protestant church. So uh, it's not as if th there was some decline going on before Vatican II. There was no decline. You know, from the point of view of, st of statistics, you might say, and the the general health of the church by vocations and uh, schools, seminaries, novitiates, uh, things like that, missionary activity. The church was in excellent condition. So it's not as if uh, Vatican II was trying to stop a general decline or anything like that. No, it, the, it blew it up, just like a bomb, just leveled the whole thing. And that's what we're living through now. And you know, when things get worse and worse and worse, they get another big syringe, more Vatican II. <laughs> you know, another, another, you know, it's not enough Vatican II. That's the, that's the solution to the problem. We haven't, and, you know, the council has not been enacted enough. It's like communism. It never got, you know, the right, you know, it was never done right. You know, since 1917, over 100 years, it's never, never been done right. Not in Russia, not in, you know, Venezuela, not in Cuba. All of the other places that had communism, all of Eastern Europe. No, that was all a failure. It was never done right. So the same thing with Vatican II is never really given a chance after 60 years of, of the complete degradation of the Catholic Church into something unrecognizable from the point of view of its history. Just not enough Vatican II, that's the real problem. <laughs> I mean, these people are, are so laden with pride. The only person I think that saw the problem was Ratzinger. I think he saw that Vatican II was a sinking ship. That's why he, he wanted the uh, traditionalists to have a certain place in the, in the sun, I think. 
because he was bright. Uh, Bergoglio, it doesn't. I don't think. I don't think he even has a brain. But the the. <laughs> Uh, I, I think he was astute, but at the same time very attached to Vatican II. And I think that he wanted Vatican II essentially to be blessed and elevated, you might say, and given a life, you know, like a transfusion by the traditionalists. Because then the traditionalists give Vatican II their stamp of approval, coexistence. So, so that's the sophism. For Protestantism, neither by its doctrine nor by its example, reformed the Romans, since its doctrine was entirely rejected by the Roman Church. Trent condemned all of it. I mean, Trent is the is the Catholic Reformation of the of the 16th century. It condemned everything that the Protestants said. The example of the reformers was such that even Luther, Melanchthon, and the other reformers were horrified by the perversity of their followers, which could be said of the Novus Ordo. The morality of Catholics has descended into the pits since Vatican II. That heresy per se gave to the world no good morals at all. For Occidens, however, it gave good morals to many Catholics whom the Lord instructed by castigation in the way that a disease might bring us to our senses. Again, I say Protestantism gave no new good morals to the world, not to the individual, nor to the family, gave divorce to the family, bigamy, nor to society. As I said, it leveled society, made it worldly and materialistic and commercial. Whatever good things it manifests, it has received from the old church. So if there's any supernatural truths in it, they are stolen from Catholicism. You might have some natural truths of religion in it, which came from their heads. Everything else is heresy. So those are the three ingredients. Stolen Catholic doctrines. and sometimes sacraments. Truths of natural religion, the existence of God, what you can reason to. And heresy. Those are the ingredients of Protestantism. Mostly heresy. Objection to Protestantism is propagated throughout the whole world, therefore it is Catholic. The antecedent is evident from the great number of those who, for the sake of preaching, are sent by biblical societies and other institutes of this type in all parts of the world also from the Protestant groups which are found everywhere. Response, I distinguish the antecedent and the proof of the antecedent. Catholicity is acquired by this propagation materially, let it pass. Formally, I deny. Catholicity formally cannot be had without unity. Very important point. If you don't have doctrinal the unity of doctrine, worship, and discipline, those are the three ingredients of any religion. You can't have Catholicity. So the Novus Ordo falls on its face in that regard. So two marks it loses. It loses unity. It also loses, by its very nature, Catholicity. Holiness, forget about. 
apostolic. It's a joke. It has abandoned the apostolic doctrine. So it lacks all the four marks. It's not Roman Catholicism. It's an alien religion inhabiting Roman Catholic churches and Roman Catholic institutions and organizations. Therefore, Protestantism, lacking the principle of unity, is essentially alien to true Catholicity. With regard to activity and, uh, and the zeal for missions, it is commonly admitted that a great force of money is expended in evangelizing peoples and that many worthy and diligent men give help in order that the light of the gospel come to those who are sitting in the shadow of paganism. But the quantitative and qualitative fertility is not proportioned to the enormous subsidies. The apostolic virtues are much more evident in the Catholic missions the great diversity of sects has the effect that division is propagated at the same time that partial faith is propagated, that is, you know, some, some truths, and that the religion which the founder described as one fold and one shepherd is not evident among the many peoples. So if you're, if you're colonized by the British, then the, the monarch in England is the head of your church. Why do you have to regard a monarch in England, like Edward the uh, Eighth, for example, Edward the Seventh, who was a totally debauched and fat human being, totally, I mean, grossly debauched thing, all right, that he's the head of your church? Why is it tied to nationality? Or all of the ortho, the Russian or the, the czar is the head of your church. <laughs> See, it, it, it's, uh, it's all tied to ethnicity and nationality. Or the king of Sweden is the head of your church. Or the, 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 the Dutch whatever monarch is the head of your church. And different different dogmas. And there's, you know, there's not one fold and one shepherd there. So they, they labor under the same problem, always. And since very swift propagation is considered to be an index of Catholicity, but Protestantism, as soon as Luther rose up, was very swiftly propagated throughout Europe. Therefore, it is Catholic. Response, I distinguish the major. Very swift propagation is considered an index of Catholicity. In certain circumstances, I concede, by itself I deny. Likewise, I distinguish the minor. Protestantism was very quickly propagated in a divine manner, I deny. In an entirely human manner, I subdistinguish. In many parts of Europe, I concede. In all of Europe, I deny. Those things are more easily believed which please the earthly man. But the gospel which was preached by the reformers, because it, one, proposed a liberty of spirit and conscience, enticed an eagerness for rebellion, by which men who could not bear authority often have fallen into heresy. I mean, the, the French Revolution was merely the social expression of the rebellious nature of Protestantism. Too, because fasting, celibacy, and ecclesiastical laws were rejected and salvation was offered to men by faith alone. And because ecclesiastical goods were assigned to the greed of the princes, Henry VIII took all the monasteries and gave them to his buddies. And because a pretext of waging war and of rebelling was offered to those who were desirous of changing things, it attracted an enormous multitude by the allurement of living softly or of sinning more freely. So there was uh, many natural enticements and natural threats. So 
dynasty in England, you would suffer a great deal if you did not recognize the king as the head of the church. The, as Father Randolph called him, that, that uh, rotting mass of syphilis. He was a former Anglican. He said that in a sermon once. Beautiful in English accent. Henry VIII, that rotting mass of syphilis. <laughs> Uh, that you know, so you would get into big trouble. So you say, well, you know, we don't want to lose my, you know, we don't want to get my head chopped off and all this. So I better go along. And then you had in Germany the that you couldn't, you wouldn't be tolerated as a Catholic. You would have to move to another region. So there was a a a force of uh, secular power in all the Scandinavian countries. That was true secular power that either threatened or made it enticing because it was enticing to somebody to be able to get rid of the wife and marry again or as luther said you know if you are having he didn't say it exactly like this but he's you know if you can't have relations with your wife then let the maid come in it's a quote from luther So fornication, adultery, bigamy, those things are appealing to people. There is no religion on the face of the earth that has a stricter morality than the Catholic Church. Three, since the condition of the times was such that many were in, imbibing mentally the doctrines of the pagans and the discipline in many members of both uh, clergy and had almost ceased. So you had that, you had humanism, very prevalent, nominalism. Uh, and also a big breakdown in the the discipline of the clergy, particularly in Germany. Not so much in England, but particularly in Germany. Germany was a wreck for discipline of the clergy. It was impossible that error not spread to those who were uh, predisposed. So the, the, the priests who were living with somebody, you know, then they could get married, like Luther married a nun. You see, that's great, you know, I'll marry this lady I'm living with. Nor are we ignorant of the fact that Protestantism instituted very cruel laws against Catholics. So England, Holland, um, Germany, um, you know, uh, Scandinavian countries, it was all the same. Objection three, that church does not lack apostolicity which draws its doctrines from the writings of the apostles. But the doctrine of the Protestants is drawn from this sacred source, therefore Protestantism must be regarded and considered apostolic. Response, I distinguish the major, that the church is not lacking, that church is not lacking apostolicity whose doctrine is taken from the writings of the apostles by legitimate authority, I concede, by no legitimate authority, I deny that which must be investigated because of the marks cannot be called itself a mark. For this reason, the external and public fact of apostolicity is required in order that it be evident whether among Protestants the true understanding of scriptures exists or in the Roman church. But the public fact of apostolicity is the legitimate succession of pastors. Therefore, we have the the right to reproach the Protestants with this most basic sentence of the fathers, let them produce the origins of their churches, let them show the order of their bishops. See, they have no connection to the organization that was founded by Christ upon the apostles. They have no connection to that. 
That's essential to the Catholic Church. Instance, from the beginning, there were not lacking those who opposed the private spirit to the authority of the church, such as the ancient monuments of heretics prove. Through them, the church of the apostles has come down to the Protestants. So they're saying all of these heretics that the church condemned in the past, they were all the early Protestants. Response, I distinguish the major. From the beginning, there were not lacking those who opposed private spirit to the authority of the church. By legitimate succession, which was not interrupted from the apostles, I deny, otherwise let it pass. However many churches which spurned authority, one, manifested their recent origin when they abandoned that church which came before them. See, because they abandoned it. <laughs> See, that's the, 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 the key problem today. Two, have shown no indication of legitimate succession since they came forth by dissidents alone, dissenting both from the authority of the church and as they divided themselves into sects. It is lengthy to bring to mind all the heresies with which the Protestants, who boast of a kind of apostolicity, assert for certain that they are in communion. But from wherever they may seek their kind, their modern and ancient heresies are condemned by their novelty. And again, you don't find Protestantism in those. All you do is find rebellion. That's the only common denominator. They rebelled against the organization of the church the authority of the church. It's the only common denominator. But I mean, you know, Gnosticism, there's, there's no doctrinal continuity there that say, where the Protestants can say this, here we are back in the fourth century. Arianism, Article 2, whether holiness, Catholicity, and apostolicity pertain to Phocianism. The schismatic churches have received the name of Phocianism. We do not want in any way to assert that each one of the schismatics is evil in the sight of God, who are members of that group in good faith, and who obtain the most efficacious means of eternal salvation in the truths and the sacraments which the Phocianism took from the Roman church. All right, so that's Antiphene. And look at the footnote. The difference between this statement and the heresy of Vatican II is that the author here is referring to the valid sacraments and truths which the Phocian sects have taken, Cardinal Mazellus has stolen, from the Catholic Church. Vatican II asserts that the non-Catholic sects themselves as sects are means of salvation. It follows that the separated churches, referring to non-Catholic churches, and communities as such, though we believe them to be deficient in some respects, have been, by, like bigamy, have been by no means deprived of significance and importance in the mystery of salvation. For the Spirit of Christ has not refrained from using them as a means of salvation which derive their efficacy from the very fullness of grace that in truth entrusted to the church. So it's the sect itself. So the, the it is possible for somebody in a Phocian sect to receive valid baptism. Their baptisms are valid. Valid Holy Eucharist, in principle, they're, they're, that sacrament is valid among them. Uh, and to, it's possible that they could have perfect contrition for their sins. It's, they would hear, to a great extent, Catholic truths. Uh, not, not all of them, but many of them, the real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist, for example, and therefore, it, by that way, achieve eternal salvation, but not by means of the sect, because again, the sect has the poison of being the, uh, separated from the true church of Christ, which of itself would send you to hell, of itself. See, it's per accidens, that they would somehow make their way through that, through invincible ignorance and all of the other acts that they would have to posit and, and achieve eternal salvation in that way, always intending to belong to the true church of Christ and wanting to. See, that's a whole different thing from saying that the sect itself 
is a means of salvation. It's a whole different thing. So the church never denied that. But that's not what Vatican II is saying. And I gave you the Latin too. If it said those churches have certain valid sacraments and preach certain truths whereby somebody might, through invincible ignorance and with the intention of belonging to the true church of Christ and by positing all of the other necessary acts, might attain eternal salvation. But the sect itself has the poison of being of repudiating the authority of the Roman pontiff, which is necessary for salvation. That's a dogma of the church, Boniface VIII. It's a solemnly proclaimed dogma that unless you that that submission to the Roman pontiff is necessary for salvation. They contain that deadly poison as a sect. And it cannot be a means of salvation any more than a plane without wings can fly you someplace. All right. So that, that's, you have to make those distinctions very important. And that's, you know, because somebody could come back and say all of the things that I just said, well, somebody could you know, learn about the Holy Eucharist and all of this and that and the other thing. There's a big distinction. The sect itself, as a sect, as an organization, is not a means of salvation. It is a means of damnation. But because it has so many things that it stole from the Catholic Church, it is possible to, given a whole bunch of conditions, to achieve eternal salvation, not by means of the sect, but by means of belonging to the Catholic Church in voto. So get that straight. Okay, because that'll be thrown up against you. <clears throat> yes. No, he wouldn't have to uh, be reconciled before the end of his life. It would be sufficient that he retain the idea of belonging to the true church of Christ. That is the, uh, to belong to the Catholic church in voto. But with all the invincible ignorance that is necessary, in other words, he has no idea, he grew up in Greece and you know, never heard of the Catholic church, maybe. You know, thinking that he belongs to the true Christian church, true church of Christ by going to his local Orthodox church and uh, that uh, he has uh, perfect contrition for his sins, and valid baptism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 